Welcome, everybody. I'm Lois Winter, representing New York County Historical Committee, and I'm so glad you're able to come today, even though it's a very pretty day outside that you decided to come in. That's great. This is the second of three in a series the York County Historical Committee puts together. There are more brochures about the next one coming up out in the hall, but I want to get right to what we're going about to do today um, because if you are living York County or you're interested in history, you know that in Yorktown, it's permanently 1781 all the time. <laughs> And on, in fact, on October 19th, it gets to even be more of 1781, and that's where we are. But actually, York County was uh, begun in the 1630s, and Yorktown itself was started in 1691, so there's over 300 years of history here. There's lots of other things that happened besides the Revolutionary War, so trying to pull up some more of that other information. And especially um, African American history, which you would hardly even know happened, but it did, and I'm um, proud to say that um, in 2013, we had a ceremony called the Middle Passage Ceremony, in which we put up a sign, and the sign looks something like this, it says, Remembering Ancestors. And if you go down to Water Street, next to the Archer Cottage, there is this sign saying that Yorktown was actually a slave port. And uh, very few towns that were slave ports announced that or say that. But when we had the ceremony and on the sign, I would like to read one of the things it says. It says, the entire York River District between 1698 and 1750 was the center of the overseas trade. And during this period, over 80% of imported Africans were disembarked on the shores of the York and the Rappahannock River. 80%. I mean, they had to come. This has had a port here, of course. When they made Williamsburg the capital, there's no water, right? So that slaves came from somewhere. And so there is a sign that says that. It also says that over 31,000 Africans entered the York River District between 1698 and 1771. And then we, you know, we kind of lose track after that. Then what? And where did they go and sort of what happened? So this, it looks like a wonderful way to continue the story and talk about what happened during, those peri during that period of time and that period afterwards in Virginia and through our waterways. So I'm just so delighted to have Dr. Um, Cassandra Newby Alexander here because she wrote this book about the Underground Railroad and the waterways in uh, Virginia. She's the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Professor of History at Norfolk State University. She's also Director of the Joseph Jenkins Roberts Center for the African Diaspora Studies. She's an author whose publications focus on Virginia's African American history. She's appeared in a number of documentaries and episodes on C-SPAN. She serves on numerous boards, including the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation, the Virginia Law Foundation, the 2019 Commemoration Commission, the Historical Commission of the Supreme Court of Virginia, the Norfolk Sister City Association, and WHRO. And she has a list of books here, but the book she's going to tell us about is this Virginia Waterways, and so I'm so happy to have her. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Dr. Newby Alexander. Thank you. Thank you so much for that gracious introduction. I'm going to just kind of move over here to the side. You know, my, um, this book was a long process. One of the hardest things in the world is to talk about what was the largest state in America for a long time. Not only in terms of population, but land size. It wasn't until the Civil War, and that, of course, when part of Virginia separated or seceded from it, and then later created West Virginia, that the size of the state reduced, but the population continued to be the largest in the South until almost the 20th century. Actually, in the nation until almost the 20th century. And it's because of so many migrations that began to happen, not only in Massachusetts and, and Pennsylvania, but also in New York. But that really would, was recent as opposed to long. And so here in Virginia, we are really the crossroads of America. There's so much of our history that um, 
impacted the entire nation. And most Virginians don't realize how important our history is and how so many people started here and went to other places in this country. And that was certainly true of those who were part of the Underground Railroad. Whether they were fugitives, people who were enslaved, and as most historians today refer to them, they were freedom seekers. They took their own power, as Frederick Douglass said, I stole these hands, these feet, this body. He stole it from somebody who claimed to own him, and he escaped. And so these freedom seekers were determined to find their own self-aggrandizement, and they took a chance. But then there were others who helped them, both free and enslaved, both black and white. And each person who helped them risked. Sometimes they risked their freedom. Other times they risked their lives. And so the story that I'm going to tell you is really just a taste of the things that I uncovered. And the book is really just a fragment of the kinds of things that I've uncovered that I'm working on a much longer narrative that will cover much, much more than the book. I actually, when I was working on the book, I actually had to cut about 10,000 words out of the narrative just to fit it within the prescribed number because the story is incredible. Former Norfolk resident and fugitive slave Isaac Foreman was described as a 23-year-old dark mulatto. You know, people really loved colors back then. They had every color you can imagine, from cinnamon to light to medium to dark mulatto to brown. To, I mean, it, to people spent a little too much time focused on color. Anyway, he was called the property of Mrs. Saunders, who was a widow who hired him out as a steward aboard the steamship, the Augusta. Now, most people don't realize that enslaved people really worked not only in every single hotel, plantation, business in Virginia, but they dominated the waterways. And you would think for, for um, a colony and a state that wanted to maintain the institution of slavery, that allowing people to have access to transportation that would take them away is kind of stupid. But then we know human beings not only are selfish, evil little buggers, but we can be pretty stupid as well. But it was a good thing for those who were enslaved. And so he worked aboard the steamship, and the steamship company paid his owner $120 annually. Now that's in the thousands of dollars today. So he was her pension. And that's why so many widows held on to enslaved people, especially enslaved men, and they hired out their time. Foreman used this mobility to escape in December of 1853 aboard another steamship called the City of Richmond. And, this, and those steamships primarily plied the waterways from Richmond all the way down to the Norfolk port, then out and over to Philadelphia. Sometimes the smaller schooners would go up to Boston or New Bedford, and some of these larger ships also went to Boston. He was assisted by two men. They were both conductors, one black and one white. John Minkins, who's mentioned by the station master on the Underground Railroad in Philadelphia called William Still, he helped a lot of people escape, including Henry Brown, the one they call Henry Box Brown, who escaped from Richmond by having himself nailed in a box and shipped to Philadelphia. So John Minkins was a free black from Norfolk. The other man who helped him escape was William Bagnall, Interestingly, William Bagnall was a prominent white man who lived in the city of Norfolk, who was actually voted in as the cashier of the Bank of Virginia. He owned a slave, and yet he was reportedly married to a woman who was enslaved. And I don't know how many of you know, that was not that unusual. Robert Lumpkin, 
who owned what they call the Devil's Half Acre, one of the most notoriously horrific slave jails in the, in the state, actually in the South. He lived in Richmond. He was married to a free black woman. And after he died, she and their children inherited all of what he had. And she would later donate land to what became Virginia Union University. And she helped many, many people become educated. So she took that horrific past and kind of re reshifted it or refocused it to something very powerful. So going back to the story, Isaac Foreman and his fellow fugitives, and he ran away with two men, William Davis and Willis Reddick. Um, they ran away and ended up, and successfully ran away, and ended up in Toronto. Now, this is an example of one of the steamships. This is the Augusta, the one that he worked on. And there are several incarnations of the Augusta. And then when they made it to Toronto, both Foreman, Davis, and Reddick all worked at the Russell's Hotel. Now what's interesting is that Foreman was going back and forth on the Augusta between Norfolk, Richmond, and all the way to Philadelphia, sometimes to Boston. He had a wife, and his wife was in Richmond. And when he decided to escape, he said, he thought to himself, no, I'm not going to tell my wife. If I tell her, she's going to convince me to stay. And I don't want to stay. And so he left without telling her. Once he settled in to Toronto and to his work at this hotel, he fell into a deep depression. He wrote to William Still that he was, quote, very gloomy, and his heart is almost breaking about his wife. In his second letter to William Still, and I hope you notice, I'm saying letters, because some of these people were literate. He said, quote, my soul is vexed. My troubles are inexpressible. I often feel as if I were willing to die. I must see my wife. In short, if not, I will die. What would I not give no tongue can utter? Just to gaze on her sweet lips one moment, I would be willing to die the next. I am determined to see her sometime or other, end quote. It is not known whether Foreman ever reunited with his wife. Eric Fawner's 2015 book, Gateway to Freedom, The Hidden History of the Underground Railroad, was correct in arguing that many men and women fled slavery, sometimes reluctantly, or after the fact, as is the case of Foreman, they left their spouses, their children, parents, and siblings. In powerful and sometimes incongruous ways, these family connections affected the enslaved person's decision to flee and their future course, such as Henry Box Brown, who tried three times to buy his wife's freedom and was swindled out of his money two times, the first time by his owner, the second time by an attorney. When he was trying to raise money a third time, his wife was sold away. And, and in his account, he talks about how he walked with his wife, who was chained in a coffle gang, holding her hand for two miles until they drove him away with a whip. And he stood there and watched her until he could see her no more. And he sank into a very, very deep depression for several months. And in his desperation, he decided he would try a scheme that a lot of people didn't succeed in. He had himself nailed in a box. And he brought a little device with him to bore a little hole in the box so he could breathe. And he would be in that box for over 25 hours. And he could not move because, of course, if, he was, if the box was big enough that he could move, he would be heard tumbling around. 
And he had a big sign that said, this side up. You know what happened halfway through his journey, right? He was on his head for half the journey. He thought he would die, and there were a number of people who did die. And if you go to the Library of Congress website, you'll see a picture of Henry Box Brown being released from the box. The abolitionists who connected with him, they took the box, but they didn't open it on the docks because other people had tried and failed, and they were dead in the box. So they took it to a safe house. The picture that they have of Henry Brown is not a picture of, or drawing of Henry Brown, because the person who drew it didn't know what he looked like. So he grabbed the only black person that he knew, and that was Frederick Douglass, which is why the image looks like Frederick Douglass instead of Henry Brown. But these kinds of things happened. This is the passion of, of the people. So despite extreme and coordinated efforts by Virginia slaveholders, there were a number of people who did successfully escape. But keep in mind, Virginia slaveholders were Virginia's elite. There was not a single Virginian who was part of the upper middle classes who did not own at least 10 enslaved people. That included all of the founding fathers who were from Virginia. That included all of the legislators. That included all of the governors. That included all of the judges. And so you can imagine that they had skin in the game. And they made sure that legislation was put in place that would protect their rights as slaveholders and begin to eliminate even the rights of those free blacks that they saw challenged, some kind of way challenged the institution of slavery by being a visual representation of potential freedom. And so I want you all to understand that the number of people who successfully escaped was small compared to the number of people who had been enslaved. In 1860, for example, on the eve of the Civil War, there were over 4 million enslaved people in this country. And there were about 4 and a half, well, 450, approximately, 450,000 free blacks in this country. And so you have to understand, this is still a small percentage. Now in the South, of course, the population uh, ratio was much higher of blacks to whites than in the North. But even in northern areas, such as Massachusetts, 26% of their population was black. And this was up to the end, I mean, up to about the period of the 1840s. Uh, in Pennsylvania, it was about 27%. In Virginia, it was close to 50%. In South Carolina, it was 60 plus percent. So you have to understand that the ratios were different in the South than in the North. And that meant that the presence of free blacks, such as in Southampton County, when Nat Turner's revolt happened, somehow free blacks got involved in that. They really didn't. But according to the reaction of the legislators, they did, because so much fear was there about this huge presence of free blacks in Southampton County. There were, percentage-wise, more free blacks in Southampton County than any place else in the country. And after that, there was legislation put in place to try to force free blacks to leave by limiting their rights and by encouraging them to leave and go to a newfound colony called Liberia. Some left. Many left Virginia as opposed to leaving the country. And so I want to kind of put this all into context. Because from the first forced arrival of Africans, and, and I want to note that these were West Central Africans. They came from the Angolan area. And these were people who had been free, and they were captured in warfare and sold as slaves. From the time they arrived at Point Comfort in the Jamestown colony in, in 1619, 
until the end of the Civil War, you would see the quest for freedom, the quest for equality continue and be just as passionate, just as pervasive. Even during the period in the early years of the 1600s, before Virginia actually instituted officially slavery, of course, the practice was there. But before a single law instituting slavery was initiated in Virginia, and Massachusetts beat us by almost 20 years, even before then, we would see freedom suits, Africans filing lawsuits saying that they were Christians and they should be free because according to English law, no Christian can be enslaved. And we would see judges after judges after judges rule that your color is the determiner for slavery, not your belief, even though that was contrary to the law. And so I want you to know that in that period, it wasn't just in the 1850s or 1840s or 1830s, the height of the Underground Railroad. It wasn't just then that people of African descent were trying to get their freedom. And by the way, in Virginia and in North Carolina, it wasn't just people of African descent who were enslaved. Native peoples were, were uh, captured in warfare and sold. Even when the law said that you could not enslave a native person, that didn't stop some officials. They simply referred to them as mulattoes and sold them as slaves. And so we have this very interesting, very complicated history that may explain a lot of who people are and where they're located and how things happen. Well, the decision to escape was different depending on the person. What happened in the lives of slaveholders often determined what would happen to the enslaved person. So if a slaveholder died, it meant people would be sold. If a slaveholder was in debt, it meant people would be sold. And who would be the primary people sold? Those who were at the height, so they, the teenagers and young adults and especially men, they would be the first ones to be sold. And that meant if you were married, if you had parents, you more likely would see your father, your husband, sold away. And you would never see them again because they weren't often sold to the next town or plantation. By the period after the American Revolution, they were sold to Tennessee and to Kentucky. They were sold to Arkansas and Alabama. They were sold a thousand miles away. And that meant you would never see them again. And so what would prompt people then to decide to take a chance, even though the price might have been that you would be sold away? It would be for those reasons. And there were people of good conscience everywhere. But you know, a person of good conscience is not someone who just thinks well. It's a person who acts, who decides that that particular sacrifice is worth it. You know, as they say, that's where the tire meets the road when you decide that your morals are worth a cost to you. As long as you can rationalize it and don't take any action, then, you know, your morals are just hypothetical. But there were a number of people of good conscience who secretly helped. And that's why we have this thing called an Underground Railroad. And by Underground Railroad, even in the 1890s, People were thinking, oh, you're talking about a railroad that runs underground. No, no, we're talking secret. And it was so secret. And you know, it's hard for human beings to keep a secret. My grandfather always would say to people who would tell him 
I, want, I need you to keep this a secret. He said, wait a minute, if you can't even keep it a secret, how are you going to tell me to keep it a secret? So if you can imagine this network that was costing slaveholders and states thousands of dollars, it was secret. It was secret. We're still uncovering new things even today because there have been many uh, papers, records. If they weren't destroyed, and a lot were, they're hidden in someone's attic and only now being uncovered. So we're still learning more and more, and we're piecing things together. And as, as Canada, especially in the Ontario province, begins to collect and digitize a lot of their records, we're able to find out a lot more. I wanted to, for us to look at this particular map. So we're here in this area along the York River. And of course, this is the Chesapeake Bay, the Atlantic Ocean. And down here, of course, is Norfolk. And here's the James River. So you see this area, and I have to cross, whenever I cross this area, I just, it's horrible because no one knows how to drive through a tunnel or over a bridge. Um, and so this area is called the Hampton Roads because all these rivers are converging. And you can't even really see the many, many rivers that are converging. It's a deep, deep water area. And that's why it's such an important port area. But here along the York River, this was one after the James River, after plantations, began being established along the James River in and around Jamestown, the York River was the next area that began to be settled. And that area, of course, went further. It was a higher elevation area, and it went further inland. And the, because it was high elevation, that meant that the tobacco production could be better. The soil was better. Down in the Tidewater area, my area, Norfolk, Portsmouth, Chesapeake, Virginia Beach, even parts of Suffolk, the area is too low lying. And so the soil is not good for tobacco production. It has too much salt and other things in it. But in this area, this was key to tobacco production. And that's why so many people began to populate the area around the York River. And the people who controlled the York River were the prominent planters. And they would establish their plantations right there on the river. They would have these huge wharves. And they would begin bringing in goods. And most of those plantations actually had uh, stores where they would sell to the rest of the population. So they had a 360 degree way of making money. They not only employed most of the people around in the area, but they sold the goods as well. And who did they employ? They employed coopers who built the barrows, the shipping containers. They employed blacksmiths and carpenters and so forth. So this became a very key area, which is why as, as um, um, was mentioned in the introduction, why this was key to the transatlantic slave trade. Because if you see also, right here where it's located, right around Cape Charles, you go straight in here. And that was an important area because as these big plantations established wharves, they were the ones who were funding the ships to come in. And they were purchasing or arranging the purchase of these people being brought in. Virginia, in the 18th century, um, had about 50 ships that traversed the seas. Now, most of them did not go to the continent of Africa. Most of them went to the West Indies, to the Caribbean. Cuba was a big place, as well as Barbados, Jamaica, and other islands. And so that's where they were bringing people in and selling them to the plantation owners throughout. And so it's important that you see this. Now, this map doesn't paint the, the kind of picture that I really want to paint 
But with all of these rivers, all of these rivers, and look at how far the James River goes. Now, of course, you can't sail the James River all the way from here on up because it hits what they call the fall line. That means the elevation is so high you have waterfalls. But once you get past that elevation up higher, you can go pretty deeply into the interior of Virginia. But even these smaller rivers, the Nazma River, which you can't even see on this smaller map, the Nazma River is huge if you've been to the area of Suffolk. So our rivers, let me, let me rephrase. If you go to Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, our creeks look like their rivers. Our rivers look like bays to them. So our rivers are huge, they're deep, they're navigable, and they're not new because native peoples who were in this area, who are still in this area, use the rivers to, to, um, for transportation, communication, and trade. Their nearest neighbors were not the nearest neighbors by land. Their nearest neighbors were neighbors by water. In fact, it wasn't until the 20th century that our perspective in Virginia turned inward. Most people plied the seas around here as opposed to the roads. And you know, just in case you're caught in traffic and you're angry and you're fussing, you can blame the rivers because we depended so heavily on the rivers that we didn't build too many roads around here. That's why there's so few roads. If you're going, if you're trying in Virginia Beach, for example, there's basically one road going east and west, and that's Virginia Beach Boulevard, one road, and one road going north and south, and that's Independence. So you try to avoid either of those roads, but you can't because the alternative is the interstate. It's six to a half dozen, and that's all you have. Whereas if you were able to ply the seas, you'd probably get there a lot quicker. But it's for that reason, the waterways were so important, and that's where people live, all along and close to the waterways. The interior part was mostly wooded areas unless you had a plantation. And if you were in Hampton Roads, there weren't too many plantations because the soil did not support the crops. So you had small towns and you had small cities, but you did not have large plantations. You have to come up in this area and further north to get the large plantations. In 18th century lower tidewater, we saw this dominance then of the maritime industry. People bringing goods in and out. And of course, in eastern North Carolina, most of them transported goods um, here to the Norfolk, well, to the Norfolk area, and then from out, of course, it would go. And I'll talk about exactly how they made sure that went better. In May of 1751, there was a young man, he was about 27 or 28, his name was Charles. He escaped from his owner in York County by hiding out, somehow getting to Hampton or to Jamestown, and he hid out there. Why did he hide out there? Because in both places were large free black communities. Williamsburg, in this time period, was about 50% black. Presumably, Charles went toward Hampton because of the numerous black sailors and seamen who worked aboard countless vessels along the wharves and in the vicinity of this important seaport. In fact, most of us don't think about Hampton having seaports. Hampton just kind of disappeared as a seaport town after about the 1830s, and then Norfolk rose to importance. But in this time period, Hampton was pretty big. At the same time, a man by the name of Dick escaped from Williamsburg in September of that same year and was thought to be working as a ferryman in Hampton. There were others. There was a man named Mingo from Yorktown 
who pretended to be on business from his owner so he could secure passage aboard ships departing from Hampton. One can only speculate that many of these freedom seekers who took the opportunity to escape from Hampton thought that the shipping traffic would provide opportunity and cover for their escape either within or without the region. And in the 1750s, most were staying in the general area. In fact, many escaped from the eastern shore and disappeared in Norfolk because they were claiming to be free people. And that shouldn't be surprising to you. The first man who was seen as dying uh, as one of the martyrs for the American Revolution in 1770 at the Boston Massacre, Crispus Attucks, was a fugitive slave from New York who had managed to get to Boston and he was working as a merchant seaman. And when the British were uh, putting their thumb down on, on this kind of trafficking that they saw as black market trafficking, many of these individuals, like Crispus Attucks, lost their jobs. And so this idea of going from one place to another and living as a free person was not at all unusual. With the cotton gin's creation, and you know, technically we say that that was created, formed in the 1790s, although from all accounts, Eli Whitney did one thing. He popularized it because, you know, Eli Whitney was an inventor, but he was from the north. And he visited the south and then suddenly came up with a cotton gin. You know that didn't happen, right? Somebody had already created this cotton gin because American cotton, was different than Egyptian cotton. If, how many of you have felt a, a, a cotton ball out of the fields? Anyone? A few of you. So you know there are like a thousand seeds in that one little cotton ball. And it, if you were to take that, those seeds out by hand, it would take you forever. So the cotton gin quickly took those seeds out. Unlike Egyptian cotton that was silkier with its threads and, and only had a few seeds and you just take that out easily. So the invention of the cotton gin meant that for every cotton ball, you would have at least five additional plants. So in a very short period of time, you could go from being essentially um, not quite poor, but lower middle class to middle class in just a few years, and from middle class to upper middle class as long as you didn't have any scourges like the boll weevil coming in and eating your cotton or having a, a long period of drought or too much rain, you were pretty much set. And so the cotton gin provided an, an incentive for a new crop, a new cash crop, unlike tobacco that killed the soil. Cotton didn't kill the soil. And you could produce a lot of it in a very short period of time. And depending upon where you live would depend upon whether you had one, two, or three um, seasons of cotton. Around here, you get one. But if you went further south, you would get, like in Mississippi or Louisiana or East Texas, you would have maybe even three. And so you could make a lot of money with that. And this is what helped to break up the black families once again because young African-American men and African men were the prime candidates to, to go to the West, to cut down all of the trees, to create the fields, and then to plant the cotton. And we would see these horrific pictures like this, wagons leaving the area, and we would read accounts of some individuals who would write, Elizabeth Keckley, for example, she was a free black woman who worked with Mary Todd Lincoln as her seamstress. And she talked about how one day the slaveholder said, you know, to her father, get your things, you're leaving. And he had maybe an hour to say goodbye to his family forever. 
And so a lot of that happened um, where people were being taken away and they would never see their families because of this flourishing cotton trade. In fact, cotton was so big, you've heard of King Cotton. Most people don't realize that by 1860, America produced seven-eighths of the world's cotton production. Seven-eighths. Where was it primarily produced in what they call the Black Belt? I-40, 77. If you're going to the south, you go through that Black Belt where these plantations concentrated African Americans and they, they essentially raised seven-eighths of the world's cotton production. And this was when cotton production in these plantations became just as vicious just as harsh, just as inhumane as the sugar plantations we would see throughout most of Latin America and the Caribbean. And people died like flies on those particular plantations where the life expectancy was basically 20 to 25 good years of hard labor by the time you're 20. So from 20 to 45, and nobody wanted you to hang around past 20, 45 because then you work less and chances are I'm going to have to take care of you. So I want you to drop dead in the field, essentially. And so that's the world. This is the world I want you to understand existed. Now, a lot of that also existed on the tobacco plantations. I want you to, to really understand what would make someone decide that's it. But of course, if your family was there, you would want to protect your family. You would not want to leave your family unless you could take your family with you. And so there were all kinds of things going on. Now, I don't have the time to talk about the American Revolution or the War of 1812, except to say that those two wars resulted in people of African descent deciding which side is going to grant me my freedom? That's the side I'm going to support. In South Carolina, where the state legislature or the colonial legislature refused to allow any African Americans, free or enslaved, to enlist, either in the Continental Army or in their militia groups, you had a high number of African Americans joined the British Army and the British Navy. In Virginia, it depended on where you were. If you were in Tory land, which is Hampton Roads, where a lot of people were supporters of the crown, you tended to support the British. If you were in other parts of Virginia, you tended to support the American forces because it depended on who was offering you freedom, the opportunity to be free, whether to fight for your freedom or to serve in the military, or to serve as spies, it all depended. And we would see men, women, and children getting aboard British vessels and leaving the area. Where would they go? Well, some of them were betrayed and they were sold as slaves in Jamaica or even in England while others were taken either as slaves or free people to a new colony in Nova Scotia called Halifax. And I've actually had the pleasure of meeting some of the descendants of these individuals who left and ended up settling in Halifax, Nova Scotia and staying there. Some of them stayed in Halifax and then others later left and helped to create the colony of Sierra Leone in West Africa. But these individuals, interestingly, still have a lot of Virginia culture and practices, both white and black. So if you ever have a chance to go to Halifax, visit the Immigration Museum and learn a little bit about that history, or go to the Black History and Culture Museum and learn a little bit about this history. It is really fascinating. You might, if you're from Virginia, you might actually meet a relative. You never know. In the 
War of 1812, after the war, we would see Fort Monroe built. Because not a few hundred, but a few thousand people left this area aboard British ships. And of course, the British ships used the waterways and went all the way up to Washington, D.C. and bombed the snookers out of Washington. So we know that this area has been key in the nation's history. Now let me tell you a little bit, kind of bring it up to the period that most people, when they think about the Underground Railroad, let's bring it up to this period. I want to remind you once again about this map. Because here in Norfolk, Hampton, this became key to where people would go or where they would depart. And some, of course, would the ships would make their way up this way, others around, and to the places such as Philadelphia and Boston. You know, up until the time of the American Revolution, Norfolk was the third largest port in the country. Philadelphia was the largest, followed by Boston. Of course, after the war, Norfolk lost its importance at, at that level, but it continued to be the most important port in Virginia. It was the port of Virginia, established in 1680 excuse me, by the Crown. Who were these people who left? I've talked about why they left in this time period. And we're talking about now the antebellum period, any time from the 1820s on up. Who were these people? Well, we know some of their names. We know why some of them left. And we know some of the people who helped them and why some of them helped them. Some of them were really passionate. They hated slavery. They hated everything about slavery. There's a man by the name of John Fairfield who lived in the western part of the state. He was the son of a prosperous slaveholder but he hated slavery from the time he was a little child until he died in a slave revolt in 1860. He hated slavery and did everything he could to destroy slavery, including helping to his, uh, all the slaves on his father's plantation and his uncle's plantation escape from slavery. That's how much he hated slavery. I'll talk a little bit more about him in a minute. But we know about some of these individuals who escaped because of this man. He was the pack rat of all pack rats. Now, I don't like pack rats, except as a historian. I love pack rats who actually hold on to a lot of history. Um, he kept everything. He recorded everything. In fact, he was interviewing a young man who was, he became the secretary of the Vigilance Committee for the Philadelphia Abolitionist Society. The Vigilance Committee was sort of the action committee. They would help people who escaped resettle, but some of them actually started, as William Still, they started contacting ship's captains and conductors throughout the South and coordinated efforts with people in the North to help people not only resettle, but also to leave after 1850's Fugitive Slave Act was passed to actually leave the country and go to Canada, especially the Ontario province. And so William Still was talking to this young man. And William Still's family background was a little complicated. His parents had been enslaved. But they escaped, but not before one of their children had been sold away from them. And they were determined that would not happen ever again. So they escaped, and the rest of their children were born on free soil. Now, that technically did not make them free, but they lived as free people. And so William still grew up hating slavery and wanting to make a difference, and so became involved with the abolitionist group and with this group of African Americans in Philadelphia who were determined not only to help people to, to find a new life, but they were actively involved in helping to pull people from the South 
out of slavery into freedom. <coughs> Excuse me. He was talking with this young man. He found out the young man was from where his parents were from. And then he found out this young man was his long-lost brother. And he decided at that point, I'm going to start recording the names and the details of every single person who passes through my station. And I'm going to keep the letters and write to these individuals to keep up with them in the hope that if slavery ever ends, that family members could use his writings, his collection, to reconnect. And he was so determined to do that that during the Civil War, when there was tremendous fear that Philadelphia would be overrun by the Confederates, that he buried his records in the cemetery because he knew it was a map to find escaped slaves, and he did not want that to happen. He kept everything. He kept this newspaper called the Provincial Freeman, that was one of the first newspapers published by an African-American woman who had gone up to Canada and she was advocating an end to slavery and so forth. And there were no papers left when uh, people were collecting all these old newspapers and microfilming them. Until someone decided in the Philadelphia Historical Society, hmm, what is this group of boxes over here. It's been sitting here. Nobody's touched it for at least 50 years. It seems that William Still's son, after he died, donated all of William Still's papers to the Philadelphia Historical Society, and they promptly put the box in a corner and forgot it was there. And when they pulled it out, it was a treasure trove. It had every single edition to all of the abolitionist newspapers, including the Provincial Freeman. He kept notes of everybody that he encountered. His book, that is, and his notes are online, but his book entitled The Underground Railroad just grabs a few examples. Over 765 people he talked about in that book. And that's just a few examples of the people who passed through his station. His notes include so many more details. Well, in looking at that, 285 came from Virginia. Now, that's just through his station. We're not talking about all the people who self-emancipated, who didn't use anyone to help them. They just got in a cart or got in a boat or whatever and got to freedom. That does not include them. That just includes the handful of people that he encountered. He encountered, of course, a lot of people from Maryland as well as <clears throat> parts of Pennsylvania that still had slavery. The western part was kind of slow in getting rid of slavery, as well as Delaware. And there were a handful of people from other areas who passed through his station. And he, he talked about these individuals and the lives. In fact, the man who became the first African-American to be awarded the Medal of Honor, William Carney, who escaped from Norfolk in 1853, he talked about him. He talked about a state legislator, a man who would become a state legislator, who at the age of 12 escaped through the Underground Railroad and then was adopted by a white family in Boston where he finished his education, became an attorney, and returned to, this, to Hampton Roads. He lived in Norfolk County, practicing law and eventually serving in the General Assembly for at least 10 years. So this man included some important individuals in his book, but it tells us a lot about the turmoil that people went through and how they were determined to be free. This is another steamship. They all pretty much look the same. But these steamships were important in that usually you had a, a steward aboard the ship or somebody who worked in the engine room or whatever. And for a price, or it was their passion, they would secret someone in a compartment. Now, that compartment was usually a little area over the boiler room. Now, can you imagine summer, 
and you are in a compartment for two days over a boiler room. Would you be able to handle that? I'm not so sure I could. There, I would have to have a whole lot of desperation to stay in that environment. And some people had a very difficult time. There were schooner captains who also made sure, <coughs> and I just want to show you this picture. Schooner captains like this one right here, Alfred Fountain. And this drawing was actually pretty accurate. We know exactly where that happened in Norfolk. If you go to Norfolk to Norfolk Waterside, there is this plaque. And that's actually where this event occurred. Captain Fountain was a person who had a lot of bravado. Chutzpah, I guess is a better word. And he had a secret compartment on his ship um, that could fit maybe about 20 people, and he packed that compartment with people. Now, most of the people paid anywhere between $25 and $50 for passage aboard this schooner, but if Fountain got caught, he would either be sent to the Virginia Penitentiary, which was a death sentence. Most of the time, they would say 10 years in the penitentiary. They knew you would maybe survive three years, and then you were dead. And that was if you were white. If you were free black, you ran the risk of being sold as a slave. If you were an enslaved person, you would be sold away or killed. OK, so those were the risks. So Fountain, there was word, this was in 1855, there was word that Fountain had uh, about 22 people aboard his ship. So the mayor, the one in the top hat is the mayor of Norfolk. And all the other men around him were from Norfolk. They went on that ship. They heard there were enslaved people. And they were going to tear the ship apart until they found those slaves. They were convinced they were aboard the ship. So they came there with axes and pickaxes. And they were going to tear the ship apart. And Fountain said, oh, you think that I have slaves aboard my ship? Well, I'll help you find them because they're not here. And of course, he grabbed the ax and started chopping on the other side of where the secret compartment was. Well, in the picture, you see some people like, whoa, <laughs> this man's crazy. He must not have any slaves aboard the ship. While others are like, yeah, keep chopping, keep chopping. And the, half of them really were not convinced that there were no slaves aboard the ship. But they said, finally, OK, OK, we believe you. But they sent word to Philadelphia to look out for the schooner because they were still convinced there were slaves aboard the ship. This drawing is of those 22 people who were aboard that ship. And so rather than go straight to Philadelphia, they waylaid on Teague Island, which was right outside. And they were met at the top of this hill by abolitionists who helped them to escape and to gain their freedom. Now, one of the people, this a rather large woman right there, she had a particularly hard time because she couldn't fit in the compartment through the little hole that he had built. And so they decided she's not going back because, you know, if she goes back, she's going to sing like a canary. And we can't risk that. So they told her, you're going to have to strip down. We're going to grease you up, and we're going to stuff you in that hole. Now, how she got out, I don't know. After a lot of protestations, she finally agreed to that. They stuffed her down. Somehow they got her out. And so her story was especially dramatic. But that also tells you how if you're running away in a group, no one can turn back because everyone is in danger. But this also shows you that it wasn't just young, unmarried men who were running away. There were family groups because the ships allowed family groups to run away, not just young men. And most of the young men were not unmarried, as I gave you the example of Isaac Foreman. Many of them were married. 
Some of them were like Henry Brown. His wife had been sold away, and he hoped that in freedom he could find her. He never did. But that was always the hope. Then you had this group. Now, I love this group. And that picture of the woman with the pistol out in the front tells you the whole story. And what also tells you the whole story is the look of those men. Because this woman was going to kill every man who was trying to take her back if they didn't back off. And I think they knew that. She was not just waving a gun around. What happened? This event happened in 1855. And these are people, I also say, self-emancipated. There were no conductors helping them to escape. And they actually ended up in Toronto. In a, and there was two different families living in houses right next to each other. They were from Loudoun and Fakir counties. And the, the party consisted of Barnaby Grigby, Mary Elizabeth, Frank Wanzer, and Emily Foster. And they all escaped. They were married. These were couples married. And they found themselves fighting for their lives on the Cheat River in Maryland. The group was confronted by six white men and one white boy who believed the travelers were fugitive slaves. Now, I just want to pause for a minute and tell you that slave hunting was probably the biggest industry in this country for poor and middle class, lower middle class white men. It was big business. Virginia not only offered anybody who turned in a person who helped a slave escape, but it, returning a slave, the state offered you money as well as the owner. So it was big business. In fact, there was a man who was the constable, <coughs> excuse me, in Norfolk, who was the most notorious slave hunter ever. His name was Capehart. And he was responsible for going back and forth all the time to Boston, finding and bringing back fugitive slaves. So he had kind of a twofer. He not only was the constable in Norfolk, but he used that to also make additional money for himself by slave hunting. And so the group, once they were confronted, Wanzer said to the men, no gentleman would interfere with persons trying to ride civilly. So he's trying to not talk the way they were expecting an enslaved person to talk. Once the, these men and women realized that these hunters were not going to let them go, they pulled out their guns and declared they would not be taken, at least not alive. One of the white men raised his gun at one of the women and threatened that he would shoot. Now the one you're seeing, she said, shoot, shoot, while she was, of course, pointing the gun at him. <laughs> because in her mind, somebody was going to die. And it wasn't going to be her. And of course, you can imagine that was terrifying to these men. And they backed off. Two of the men on, from, um, there were six of them total, four were in the wagon. Two of the men who were riding horses galloped off. These were brothers. They ended up getting captured, but the four who were in the wagon made it all the way to Toronto and lived the rest of their life there. So we had so many events. Um, I do want to kind of speed it up. I know I'm taking a little long. I do want to talk, though about another part of the Underground Railroad. And that is, escaping didn't always meant you escaped from the state. Sometimes you stayed in the state. And you fled to a place that most people didn't want to go. And I usually, when I have an opportunity, I like to take teachers out to the Dismal Swamp. Scare the heck out of them. Because by the time they learn about all of the ticks, the fleas, the chiggers, the snakes, the bears, the da, 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 da. after they learn about all that, they are scared to move. So I usually like to take them to 
the, both of the parks. One of them in North Carolina, where there's a little museum, and they have a little walkabout. And it's all on a wooden plank, but you would think they were really out there in all of the stuff. And then I like to take them to the Virginia side in Suffolk and Chesapeake and take them to the center of the swamp, which is Lake Drummond. It's in that area that you get a, a, a good sense. And you can see Lake Drummond's right, let's see if I get the pointer, right there. And, and Lake Drummond supposedly was created by a meteorite. That's at least what the scientists think. If you go there, you must read Longfellow's poem about Lake Drummond. You go to the lake. It is a freshwater lake with nothing living inside the lake because it's filled with tannic acid. It's only about six feet deep. You hear nothing. It is absent of any sound. You hear no birds. You hear no insects. You hear nothing. It is a very strange place to be. And that was the center of the swamp. A friend of mine, Dan Sayers, who is a professor of archaeology, uh, found at least, I think the count is at least 20 maroon communities. I don't know how he does it, but every summer he takes an archaeological team out there and he has uncovered at least 20 maroon communities. These are people who lived in the interior of the swamp. They had children. They brought up children, families inside the swamp. No one saw them for the most part because the swamp today is maybe a sixth or eighth of the size it once was. The outskirts of the swamp, if you're in Portsmouth, went as far as Frederick Boulevard. So that kind of gives you a little sense of the swamp. Remember, Nat Turner was trying to make his way to the swamp, which was only about 10, 15 miles from where he was. So what we have left is tiny compared to the original size of the swamp. It was a huge area. There was a reporter from Harper's Weekly who did make it to the interior of the swamp to Lake Drummond. And he encountered Maroons. These are people who had escaped and who lived generationally in the swamp. The majority of people simply passed through the fringes of the swamp as they were making their way from eastern North Carolina or from one of the rural areas in Virginia trying to get to the Norfolk Harbor so that they could go out. And so the swamp, of course, in this picture to the left, is this is George Washington who, you know, he was a speculator. He was always trying to make money. You know, Washington was, had a good name. He was from a prominent named family, but his branch of the family was poor. And so he was always looking for ways to make money, and, and land speculation was a big way. And so he thought, let's drain some of this water, creating a ditch, which is why the first ditch built is called the Washington Ditch out there in the swamp. So that if we drain the water into the ditch, we will have farmable land. So instead of a land just filled with a lot of water, that water would drain off into the ditch and we could create all this farmable land. Well, his plan really didn't succeed. The only company that made a lot of money was a timbering company. They, in fact, the swamp was filled with cedar trees. Not so much anymore, overforestation. But the cedar trees, uh, were what they primarily made roofs, roofs out of. And so it was big business to chop down the trees, to bring them to the sawmill in Norfolk, and then to ship them out. That was big business. And they would pay uh, slaveholders a lot of money to lend out their enslaved people to work the swamp. Of course, the problem is people died a lot in the swamps from malaria to all kinds of 
diseases and accidents and attacks by animals. And, and I'm not even talking bears. I'm talking all kinds of poisonous snakes and so forth. And there were a number of free blacks who worked the swamp. So what they started doing is saying, all right, I don't care how you get it, bring in so much. You have so much time to do it. Well, a lot of the people who were living in the swamp secretly were actually in exchange for their labor, they would have food and other supplies that they would be given by the men, both free and enslaved, who worked in the swamp. One of the people who lived in the swamp was this man that um, the reporter from Harper's Weekly talked about. His name was Azamon. And that name tells you two things. It tells you he was from the area we call Nigeria, and it tells you he was a Muslim. A lot of people don't realize that by the time the slave trade really went into that area of Africa, uh, Nigeria, the northern part of Nigeria, the Hausa region, that's where Islam dominated, the southern part not so much. He even had the markings on his face of the youth initiations once you entered into manhood. So clearly, he had not been born in this country. He was transported over. But he was the head of one of the maroon communities. And usually it wasn't more than about 20, 25 people who lived in these communities, and it was in the higher ground. So it wasn't in the marshy area of the swamp. And that's why the communities were small. But these communities were important places where people who opted to live in the swamp, to survive in the swamp, would live while others used the swamp as a hiding place as they made their way to the Norfolk Harbor. I always ask people, what would it take to make you live in a swamp? If you've ever been, how many of you have been to the Dismal Swamp? Few of you, few of you. Never go in the summer. Repeat after me. Never go in the summer. Between the chiggers, the fleas, the ticks, you have the flies and the mosquitoes. And the flies are not your common house fly. These are swarming flies, and they bite. And so the, you don't just get bitten by one. You get bitten by a swarm. And so the people who live in and around the swamp have, usually they drink the, the, the water, of course, the groundwater. And the groundwater is filled with tannic acid. And wonderfully, tannic acid makes your blood not taste good to insects. So the people who live there aren't bothered by all those things. But if you go in the summer, don't walk on the grass. And if you do, and it looks like there's pollen, all over your pant leg or shoes? No, that it's not. Those are tick eggs. And you have to use some DDT to get rid of those things. Now imagine, this is what you're living in. Because the idea of freedom was so important to you that you were willing to make that particular sacrifice. But people knew there were many living in the swamp. And there were multiple runaway slave ads that we would see. And people came from all over, including up in this area. And they went somehow, they made it to that swamp area and survived there. So I want you to know about that. And I also want you to know, I mentioned the western part of the state, that area, the James River, that was past the fall line. The western part where, that was closer to Pennsylvania, and to Ohio, for people who lived out in that area, that is the area where if there were some slaveholders and they owned salt, salt mines. They did a lot of that. They were involved in that industry. And of course, it wasn't a heavily populated area. But what is interesting is that's the place where John Fairfield was from. This was also where they had a lot of iron industries. <coughs> Excuse me. And so Fairfield made use of his knowledge of the landscape and his familiarity with what people were doing. And interestingly, he used the waterways to help him. Sometimes 
he would, as a white man, of course, he was the last one anyone would suspect of doing anything. He had a Virginia accent. So, of course, he supports slavery, right? Wrong. So he would pretend to be sometimes a slave trader. He would actually be contracted out with people who had escaped and were living in the Ontario area. And they would say, I want you to bring me my mother, my father, my spouse, my children, whatever. Here's some money. And he would use that to pretend to be a slave trader. And he would actually walk people from slavery to freedom in a coffin gang with everyone thinking they were, he was a slave trader, he would put them in a boat and would take them across the, the Detroit River or whatever river to the Ontario province and to freedom. He was so dexterous that nobody did any drawing or painting of him. Nobody knew what he looked like. He was a master of disguise. He used everything at his disposal. For example, one time he was, and this was um, uh, in the 1850s, he was accompanied by two free black men who pretended to be his slaves. And he, he was supposedly hiring out these additional slaves, so he used some of the money he, was, he had gotten. And he was building boats on the Kanawha River supposedly in an effort to transport salt to the Ohio River. After the boats were completed, the enslaved men and their wives and children all got in the boat and they sailed on across the Ohio River to freedom. Local people suspected or had heard that there was a white man helping them, but they didn't know what he looked like. And I want to emphasize, we know what Harriet Tubman looks like now because Harriet Tubman made herself known. But how many of you know nobody knew what Harriet Tubman looked like except for Harriet Tubman and her, her owner? No one knew what Harriet Tubman. You know, in fact, that, that ad that they usually, you know, wanted and they show the picture of Harriet, they never had anything like that because they didn't know what she looked like. They had no description of Harriet Tubman because she, too, was a master of disguise. And she didn't trust anybody. That's why she carried a gun with her at all times. So if you were an enslaved person and you decided, you know, well, I'm not too sure I want to go, she'd pull out her gun. And she'd say, you're going to be free or you're going to be dead, because dead men tell no tales. And so you know the choice that the person <laughs> made. They'd rather be free. Virginia's Underground Railroad Network succeeded in sending countless runaways to many places, to the western part of the state, living as free people, or the northern part, but also to Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, New York, the Ontario province, which included, by the way, all these different cities and towns. Some would return to America at the end of the Civil War. Some returned during the Civil War and served in the United States Colored Troops. Some stayed, building a life for themselves. But wherever they decided to go, their commitment to freedom and equality remained. But the choices that all of these freedom seekers made were not always easy. They were not simplistic. And they were not without considerable sacrifice. And at their core was the difficulty of how they tried to balance their love of family with their desire for freedom. Thank you. Now I guess I take some questions. Sure. Yes. Okay, so Azaman, who was in the swamp, 
um, the, the reporter, he just went in and actually drew a picture and he wanted to find these maroons that he had heard about, but he wasn't there to capture them. He just talked with him, but he talked about what a frightening and commanding figure he was and how these individuals uh, were able to make a life for themselves in that area. So he reported on that. I believe it was published in 1856 or 1857. Um, and so he really didn't tell where they were in the swamp. He didn't tell anyone where they were. Um, and he wasn't trying to pull them out. So presumably, Osman continued to live in the swamp. In fact, um, there was a Colonel Wilde who was with the um, United States troops during the Civil War who specifically commanded African American troops. And he actually raised a whole regiment of troops from people who were maroons in the Dismal Swamp. So Azamon could have been part, although he would have been a little long in the tooth at that point. Uh, but but um, supposedly nothing ever happened to him. He continued to live there without anyone capturing him. Yes? Yes, I was just interested in uh, knowing where that term maroons came from. Maroon. I don't know, maroon, but uh, where was that? Why was that associated with maroon? You know, I'm not going to lie and say exactly <laughs> where it came from. Um, although it is not an English term, um, and some of the first examples of that uh, were in Brazil, as well as in the Caribbean. Wherever you had dense forestation, you had, it, it, it really means runaways. And so these individuals who ran away, they lived separate and in communities. In Brazil, there were some Maroons who were so powerful um, that they fought the Portuguese army and won and actually were recognized as an independent country uh, because they had taken over uh, a part of you know, this little section of the Amazon where they were. But exactly where that term uh, emerged, I would say, is probably more from Portugal or Spain, but I'm speculating. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes. So, for the people that were free versus those that were enslaved, did the free people have to have some documentation or something to show it? And, and how often were the free people, um, you know, being sought after to become slaves? Very good question. Um, it depends on the time period. So for much of the colonial years, um, most free people were not compelled to have any proof. But by the time we got into the beginning of the 19th century, um, most, well, actually the entire country, all the states then required that any people of African descent had to prove that they were free. They had to have free papers on them, which is why if they were captured um, and sold into slavery, one of the first things you would do is remove their free papers. And what made it worse was that free blacks could not testify against a white person in court. They needed two white people to testify on their behalf. So the law was really stacked against them because um, you could make so much money and the nation was making so much money with slavery that the whole idea of, of a, a black person having rights became a thing of the past. After the American Revolution, we turned our backs on you know, freedom, liberty, and equality completely. And we went whole hog into, we want to make money and we want to exploit this group of people so we can make a lot of money. In fact, most people don't realize that from the official end of the American Revolution, 1783, until 1806, there were more people of African descent transported into this country than all the time before. Because America was now free to go to the African continent and anywhere in the Caribbean, 
and buy as many enslaved people and bring them to this country and sell them. And then Virginia became the main exporter of slaves. In fact, Virginia made more money selling enslaved people than it did with any of the industries. And by the time we get to the antebellum, you know, the end of the antebellum period around 1860, you could add up America's industries and together it was less than the value of slavery. So slavery was big business and there were fewer slaveholders, but they owned more people. So this, you know, so we saw the rise essentially of corporate slavery. So you have people, you know, there, there are a lot of people in the past who've said, oh, slavery was going to die out anyway. No, it wasn't. There was no chance. What they were looking at were the numbers of slaveholders decreasing. What they didn't look at was that fewer slaveholders owning more slaves. So it was harder for a, a slaveholder who owned two or more, you know, two or three slaves to compete with someone who owned 10,000. And so in, in South Carolina, for example, you had about 10 families who own anywhere between four and 30,000 slaves. And they dominated the rice industry because, you know, rice was the big product in South Carolina. So the, the, the shifts against free blacks really happened in the antebellum period with the birth of the cotton gin with the expansion westward, with then the value of what these enslaved people were producing became America's industry. And then Virginia, having the largest number of, of, of people of African descent of any place in the country, and then the reproduction of those people meant that that could become and did become our primary industry. And so Norfolk became, before Norfolk it was Hampton, but Norfolk became from the 1830s to the 1860s the largest port of departure in the internal trade than any place else in the country. And we were sending people to the Charleston market, to the Savannah market, and to the New Orleans market by water. I know that was a long answer to a quick question. Yes. Is there a law that it wasn't a free black you were not allowed to stay in the state? Right. So Virginia, around the 1810s, passed a law because they were really concerned about the growing presence of free blacks. If you have slavery, it was always seen as a destabilizing factor to have free blacks because they became a source of concern. They were a model for people to aspire towards. And it was believed that free blacks would also help to undermine slavery. So Virginia, as well as several other southern states, passed a law that said if you were recently freed, you had a year to get out of the state. And if you didn't, then you could become a slave again. You would become a slave again, and they would sell you. So you had to have a special, um, you had to have special permission, a special act of the legislature to allow you to stay. So what a lot of free blacks did was they started simply purchasing their family members. And they would hold them legally as slaves, and that actually meant they had more protection because the law protected you as a slaveholder more than you as a free black. Um, and then that would allow your family to, to um, stay in the state. Of course, there's one story I have to tell you. And, you know, you always have to be careful. And there was this woman in the 1840s, I think, in Norfolk who owned her husband. And he did something. I don't know what he did. I can only imagine what he did but he made her so mad, she sold him. <laughs> then a few days later, she forgave him and tried to buy him back, but it was too late. The owner refused to sell him back. But I can only imagine that one thing that will make a woman 
go completely berserk. Men have been killed over something like this. That's the only thing I can imagine, but the records don't say exactly what happened. But yeah, and, and you know, while that law was, was passed, equally horrific were northern states, and all this is around the turn of the 19th century, northern states passed laws making it hard for, for black people to migrate into those states. And of course, you all may or may not know that the old Northwest Territory, <clears throat> what we call the Great Lakes today, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 actually prohibited the migration of, of free blacks into that state unless they put a bounty up guaranteeing their good behavior. So the nation, while you had states that were eliminating slavery, the real reason they eliminated slavery was what they wanted to get rid of all the black people. And they did not want any black people coming into those states. But then after a while, I think they realized that was not going to work. And they either eliminated or did not enforce those laws. Any other questions? Yes. Well, the, um, you know, we've all heard that slavery was eventually going to die. You answered that to a point. Uh, I understand one thing I'd always thought was that because America was becoming more and more industrialized, manual labor was eventually going to start becoming too expensive to maintain. Ergo, you weren't going to have to have as many slaves. Slavery eventually died because we were starting to industrialize a lot of those industries. Plus, the agricultural part of the industry was eventually not going to have the power, sway the economic value that the industry had. And where you are, where are we that? Is that more or less on the way of why slavery would eventually economic just wouldn't work anymore. Theoretically, that would not have happened until the 1960s because the farming equipment just wasn't put into place so that you had um, fewer laborers needed. That's why migrant farmers, for example, are so big in a lot of the truck farming areas uh, because you don't really have the equipment to you know, to harvest it except by hand. Otherwise, you, you're going to destroy the crop. Um, in the 19th century, uh, our technology was not such that that was actually feasible. Uh, that was the ration, rationalization that was part of the whole cult of the lost cause that emerged in the 1870s and 80s. Um, the Slavery was big business, and, and the South actually refused to further industrialize because they wanted to maintain their system, and they did not see that going more into the industrialized sector would be beneficial. In fact, we had one ironworks factory in the entire state, and that was the Tredegar Ironworks Factory. And over 60% of the people who were employed were enslaved. So even our industries were filled with enslaved people. All the hotels, 90% of the people who worked the hotels were black. 60 to 90% of the people who worked the docks were black. And the same thing was true for most of the other maritime industries. The oystering industry, the crabbing and fishing industries, ferrying people back and forth primarily African-American men worked those industries. And so it really wasn't until we got into the Great Depression that we started to see some unsettling of things um, and black people losing their jobs in favor of white men taking those jobs. Um, so we started to see some of the shifts taking place at that point, but it really wouldn't be and, and, and then, of course, after that, we had the wars, especially the Second World War, that opened up a lot of industries in northern areas. And so you had more black, black men, especially, either entering the military or going to the northern areas to work in these factories so that they could have a better employment situation. That's really what changed some of the demographic dynamics of the area. 
Well, thank you all. You all have been a wonderful audience. I appreciate your attention.